Hi, I am not a lawyer. Now that the disclaimer's out of the way, let's talk about law, specifically about copyright and Nintendo. I'm Bill, welcome to the Retro Sofa. And I guess the disclaimer was kind of unnecessary because an awful lot would have to go wrong for Nintendo if they were coming to me for legal advice. Anyway, in my considered legal opinion, copyright law is silly. Copyright, as it currently stands, is designed to protect the bottom line of big corporations and limits the freedom of expression and artistic opportunities for regular people. So far, so YouTube creator, right? So what's Nintendo up to when it takes strong enforcement actions to protect its intellectual property? Let's talk about it, starting with fan games. This is Super Mario War, a cool little Mario fan game where you have to jump on your opponents, knock them out and score points. It's got a bunch of different cute characters you can play, various power-ups, it's pretty good. There's a load of different game modes, a level editor and some rudimentary network support, but it's not really for that. This is an old-fashioned sofa multiplayer game and I still load it up occasionally on my Wii for a quick bout with friends. It's open source so it's been ported everywhere you'd expect. It's a lot of fun, so you should definitely check it out. And if you regularly play local multiplayer, you could consider putting this in your game night rotation. Super Mario War was first released in 2004, developed by Florian Hufsky, who sadly died in 2009, aged only 23. As well as Super Mario War, he's best known for founding the Austrian Pirate Party and for organising the first international conference of pirate parties. That's right, there are loads. They started popping up in 2006, with the first one being founded in Sweden, concerned primarily with information freedom, privacy and copyright reform, among other things. They're hacktivists, brackets complimentary, who set up these parties in response partly to copyright law. You might think they're a joke, but there are four pirates in the EU Parliament right now, one from Germany and three from the Czech Republic. In fact, in the Czech Republic, in their national election in 2017, the Pirate Party there got 10% of the vote. It's a real thing in Europe and Florian Husky was a central player at the start of the Pirate Party movement. I'll link to his obituary from the Austrian Pirate Party in the description. Take a moment to read it and some of the comments. He was a well-loved, well-known and well-respected activist and creator. It's no wonder Florian Husky made Super Mario War. It's an open source program with no respect for copyright laws, flying the pirate flag. It wasn't his idea though. It's an open source remake of a closed source DOS game from 2002 called Mario War by Samuele Poletto. Mario War is a much simpler affair. It doesn't have bots, it has no selectable characters, no power-ups, but the basic movement and concept is there. It's on archive.org and I'll link to it of course, but it's not really worth playing today. Matyash Mostoa forked Super Mario War on his GitHub, and I'll link to that too. And Samuele Paletto's old website. Why not? Everyone gets a link. Anyway, Mario War wasn't really his idea either. Jump and Bump is an open source DOS game developed by Brainchild Design in 1998. No copyright infringement here, just happy little bunnies jumping on each other and exploding. I'm sure I played it when I was a kid, I can't remember on what or with whom, but these graphics are definitely giving me a nostalgia. Anyway, how do I know Samuele Poletto took inspiration from it? Because he lists it as one of the great freeware games on his website. What were we doing? Oh yeah, copyright. So, Super Mario War is a great little game, but it seems fairly clearly to infringe upon Nintendo's copyrights with its use of the Mario characters. It's also a derivative of Jump and Bump, but we'll leave that as an interesting aside. I want to talk about how Nintendo protects its copyrights. And I don't think they ever went after Super Mario War specifically. It's just a cool little game that I wanted to talk about and makes for a cool video title. So let's talk about some fan games that did catch the eye of Nintendo's lawyers. In 2019, Inferno Plus put out a game called Mario Royale, a Battle Royale version of the original Super Mario Brothers. It allowed up to 99 players as Mario and Luigi to run through Mario levels and compete to defeat Bowser. It lasted a week before Nintendo sent the cease and desist order and Inferno Plus replaced it with DMCA Royale, where you play as Infringio Infringio and his brother, Copyright Infringio. DMCA stands for Digital Millennium Copyright Act and it's one of the major reasons the USA has a pirate party. Look it up on Wikipedia, it's horrible. DMCA Royale lasted another week. Nintendo's lawyers didn't say exactly what the problem was with DMCA Royale, but I think it's probably a good call on the part of Inferno Plus not to fight this one any further. A year and a half later, Nintendo released Super Mario Bros. 35, a Battle Royale version of the original Super Mario Bros. This was part of the 35th anniversary of Super Mario Bros., so Nintendo only kept it online for six months. The footage you're seeing here is some gameplay I recorded on my Switch at the time. It's a shame it was only available for a little while because it was incredibly fun. The object is to be the last Mario or Luigi standing while playing through levels from Super Mario Bros. with 34 other players. You can't interact with other players directly, but enemies you defeat get sent over to other players' games and they can multiply and it gets pretty nuts. To be fair, there's not much to it, so I'm not sure how long it would maintain a player base. 
Online multiplayer games are nearly always destined to become lost media because people eventually lose interest and if you can't find players you're not going to want to play it either. But this one went way before its time. Sorry if you missed it. I really hope Nintendo revisits this concept someday. It definitely had its problems and it was certainly repetitive with players always picking the same levels. But I had a lot of fun with it. It definitely created some cool moments, which is why I have footage of it in the first place. Anyway, isn't it funny how Inferno Plus made Mario Royale, and then Nintendo sent a cease and desist letter and made their own? We'll never know for sure, but personally I don't think Nintendo stole the idea. I think they just had it in the pipeline when Inferno Plus made his game, and that's what led to the quick takedown request. But I don't know. It's just a guess. Inferno Plus, in one article which I'll link below, seems to think that Nintendo took his idea, but your guess is as good as mine and his. We don't really know what's going on at Nintendo and why they make the decisions they make. But that's not the first time people were left guessing whether Nintendo was taking inspiration from fan games or issuing takedowns against fan games because it was something that they already had in their pipeline. AM2R, or another Metroid 2 remake, is a fan remake of the Game Boy classic Metroid 2 Return of Samus. Metroid 2 was well received at the time, though not as much as the NES original despite how it builds upon it. Gunpei Yokoi and the rest of Nintendo R&D 1 didn't want to make a portable adaptation or a side story, instead opting to make a full sequel. The controls and graphics are much improved over the NES original. Samus can even crouch and shoot now. There are also several upgrades that will go on to become series staples, such as the Spazer, Space Jump, Spider Ball and Spring Ball. Spectroid! The game also tells an important part of the Metroid story that sets the stage for Super Metroid. It's a bit more linear, but it is every bit the epic you'd expect from a Metroid game, except for the hardware it's on. Don't get me wrong, it's impressive for the hardware. When I played it, I remember thinking, I'm playing a Game Boy game. Why am I nervous? It's dripping with creepy atmosphere. It starts with the upbeat music and then ambient sounds? On a Game Boy? It's a great game, and Nintendo obviously thought so too. When they released the Super Game Boy, it included a special palette built into the hardware just for Metroid 2, and then they did it again with the Game Boy Color. The Game Boy Color has 45 built-in palette configurations that are automatically assigned to certain games, with around 90 games being supported. Metroid 2 actually looks really good on the Game Boy Color, but that screen crunch. The chunky sprites, while gorgeous, don't leave much space on the Game Boy's tiny screen to see where you're going and what you're shooting. The game was very well designed to work with the Game Boy's hardware, but playing this, it definitely feels like Samus wants to be freed from this tiny screen. That's why AM2R is so called. A bunch of people wanted to take this epic game and bring it out of the tiny Game Boy screen, and AM2R was simply the most successful when it released in 2016. I played it through to completion and had a great time. It basically takes Metroid 2 and remakes it with a graphical overhaul and a playstyle similar to Metroid Zero Mission. Zero Mission being the official Game Boy Advance remake of the first Metroid game. There are so many names in this video that I'm trying to get right because I think it kind of sucks when people say, oh, I'm going to butcher this name and then don't even make any real effort. Guasti. Guasti. See, it's not hard. AM2R was started by Milton Guasti under the name Dr. M64, with the first demo being released in 2011. This was a years long passion project created at a time when Metroid had gone quiet. The last game to come out at the time was Metroid Other M in 2010, and there hadn't been a mainline 2D entry since Metroid Fusion in 2002. Dr. M64 played and loved Zero Mission, then played and loved Metroid 2, and wanted to give it the Zero Mission treatment. One day after AM2R's release, on 6th August 2016, Nintendo's lawyers started sending out tape down requests to websites hosting it. Less than a month later, on 2nd September, Dr. M64 announced he too had received a request from Nintendo and was stopping development entirely. Almost exactly a year later, 15th of September 2017, Nintendo's official remake, Metroid Samus Returns for 3DS, was released. Look, Mario Royale, whatever. Inferno Plus made it in three weeks and threw it online knowing that he'd get into trouble with Nintendo's lawyers. You can watch his video about it. He's under no disillusion about what's about to happen. It's a cool project though, and I don't know if he was being serious when he suggested that Nintendo had taken his idea for Mario 35. And really, it doesn't matter. It's just annoying we can't play either one right now. Well, not really. Mario Royale is still kind of online somewhere, but no one's playing it. AM2R is kind of sad though. It was years in the making, and Dr. M64's love for the series and his desire to create this beautiful homage to Metroid is dripping from every pixel. He went into it with no coding experience and came out with this actually incredibly well-made game. 
There is a happy ending though. Moon Studios took him on as a game designer. He worked on some levels for Ori and the Will of the Wisps, and they're about to come out with an action RPG called No Rest for the Wicked, which we're taking a little look at now. It's a much bloodier game, but maintains a lot of the dark beauty in its environments that made the Ori games so graphically unique. Combat looks cool, hack and slash with charge attacks and making clever use of the environment around you. I look forward to playing it about 20 years after its release. Well done, Dr. M64. You deserve every success, because AM2R was awesome. I'm not here to compare Metroid 2 and its remakes, but I will say this. AM2R is the best one. It's one of my favourite Metroid games, in fact. The community is still updating it. It's not hard to find. Go play it. I'll link a video about it that goes into great detail about how it plays in comparison to the original. I liked Samus Returns on the 3DS, but it didn't engage me as much as AM2R. It's fine. So what should Nintendo have done here? I don't know. I'm just a YouTuber, therefore naturally conditioned to hate copyright. In fact, I started working on a video about Super Mario All-Stars that's kind of on the back burner right now because my live stream got copyright claimed, and not from Nintendo. In 2018, a Swedish gentleman by the name of Mikael Bengtsson uploaded a song that happened to use the Super Mario Bros. music from Super Mario All-Stars as backing music. He then used a service that uploads indie releases to streaming services, and they also handle copyright claims for YouTube. Nintendo themselves are, I'm gonna say, reasonable when it comes to using their content on YouTube. It wasn't always so. There are plenty of videos and articles out there about the Creators Program from Nintendo, which saw them take a cut of revenue from YouTube creators whenever they uploaded content and included Nintendo games. Sounds bad, but it's better than what they were doing before, which was just copyright claiming any videos that included Nintendo games. Fortunately, they stopped all that nonsense in 2018. You can read their content guides a little bit here, and there's a link in the description to the full thing. And it's lawyery as you'd expect, but really it's mostly fine. Mostly. There was a case last year when Nintendo went pretty hard after one YouTuber who'd been making videos featuring modified Switch games. Nintendo basically copyright claimed all of those and then copyright claimed all of his other videos that featured Nintendo properties modified or otherwise. But Nintendo's guidelines say that they're not okay with showing footage from modified games. And really, I mean, I don't like it, but however you feel about that, it's kind of up to them. Nintendo's guidelines effectively give us all a license to use footage of their games in our artworks, and while I don't agree with all of it, I do appreciate a clear policy. In fact, I sent a link to Nintendo's guidelines when I disputed the copyright claim, which came from whatever company handles content ID for Mikhail Bengtsson's music. Incidentally, I don't think my disagreement is with Mikhail Bengtsson. He made a little song with the Mario music and uploaded it, and that's between him and Nintendo. The company he used to release his music just happens to be set up with YouTube's automated content identification system, and that's where it got messy. I'm not the problem, he's not the problem, the company releasing the music isn't the problem, even YouTube's not the problem. The whole system is the problem. And that's where I've landed on these Nintendo fan games. Capitalism and copyright are flawed systems that inherently work hand in hand. Nintendo is a big company, and as a big company, it has exactly one concern. Profit. Goodwill from their most invested consumers gets them some value, but it's far from the whole story. Nintendo's properties are blatantly ripped off left, right and centre by various rip-off merchants hoping to make a quick buck. Fan games are not that, to be clear. Fan games are lovely. But companies are financially incentivized to protect their copyrights regardless of how lovely the infringement. You might have heard that you have to protect your copyright in order to keep it, but that's not quite true. Copyright is for a set time. You have legal copyright of a work after you've made it for the time specified in law regardless of what you do with it. The difference is in the damages you might be awarded if you took it to court. If you're regularly letting people infringe your copyright but you go after one person that's particularly egregious in some way, the judge in the case might not see that infringement as more egregious than any other. You and I both know that making and distributing Super Mario War for free is fine, but there are much more cynical bootlegs out there that have no cultural value whatsoever and exist just to make a bit of cash out of stealing Nintendo's intellectual property. Judges don't necessarily know what fan games are, and if Nintendo is seen to be, and seen to be is important, inconsistent with how it protects its intellectual property, or IP, that can be seen to devalue the property. I'm not saying it's a calculation I'd make, but it's a reasonable calculation Nintendo's made to be quite strict with its IP protection. Especially in the examples I've cited, where Nintendo was about to bring out similar games and actually the AM2R situation kind of worked out for the best. Nintendo protected their IP and was seen to be doing so. Dr. M64 learned to code and got a great job in the industry, and we got to play AM2R. 
The development of AM2R was very public and there were plenty of demo releases, but Nintendo didn't go after Dr. M64 until the project reached a fairly finished state. I know he had other plans for it, but it was fully playable from start to finish with no major bugs before Nintendo made him stop working on it. I'm holding back my opinions a little on how Nintendo played it, but in this situation and within the system we have, it kind of worked out pretty well for everyone involved. It doesn't always though. Team SCU's Metroid fan game Prime 2D got taken down immediately after the first demo went out in August 2021, and they've been working on it for about 15 years. Remember before Breath of the Wild released and Nintendo put out these cool prototype videos based on The Legend of Zelda? Winter Drake thought so too, and created Breath of the Ness. That lasted about two weeks after being previewed in April 2017. And then there's Game Jolt. Game Jolt is a social community platform for gamers, where gamers can share the games that they create. In December 2020, they got a letter from Nintendo's lawyers asking them to take down 379 fan games from their platform. I think it's a real shame about those fan games, and in my opinion what Nintendo did was morally not great, but it was unfortunately legally correct. Game Jolt had ads on the pages hosting those fan games, so they were making money off Nintendo's property, and Nintendo couldn't have that. Within late-stage capitalism and its associated copyright system, Nintendo is just doing the best it can to protect its bottom line. So what's the deal with Sonic Hedgehog? Well, Sega takes a different approach to fan games. In fact, this game, Sonic Mania, was originally advertised as by the Mania for the Mania. Development was led by Christian Whitehead, also known as the Taxman, who had previously developed mobile ports of Sonic 1, 2 and CD using his own retro engine, officially released by Sega, that is. Sega had tried a few times to make 2D Sonic games again, but they couldn't quite get the physics right. Uh, see, for example, Sonic the Hedgehog 4 Episode 1 and Sonic the Hedgehog Genesis GBA. These games didn't have the momentum that made the original Mega Drive games what they were. See, Sonic was never really about speed. The 90s Sonic games, and Mania, are momentum platformers. How the characters move and feel, how weighty and how slippery is crucial to the Sonic experience. The Taxman understood this, and his retro engine pretty much nailed it. After a year of badgering Sega, they let him work on a port of Sonic CD, and the rest is history. But before ever working with Sega, Christian Whitehead was a long-time member of the online Sonic fandom. He first showed off the retro engine in his fan game, Retro Sonic, which had its first demo release in 2002. This is that very demo. Notice the physics aren't quite there yet, but it's close. And cool to think that this is how Sonic Mania started, and also that Sega was fully okay with it. Consistently so, too. I've not been able to find any examples of Sega targeting Sonic fan games. They've sent tank down requests for Streets of Rage Remake, but they've always been cool with Sonic fan games. Sega's policy on Sonic fan games is summarised in this tweet from social media manager Kate Shinovsky. It's pretty straightforward. Basically, do what you want, but don't monetize it, and Sega reserves the right to deal with any content put out there if they feel that they have to. Like, it's probably not okay to buy billboards and plaster them with Sonic fan art from the deeper recesses of DeviantArt. So why the difference in approach? Well, I mean, it starts from the same thing I've been saying all along. Sega isn't morally good and Nintendo isn't morally bad. They're both just big companies making decisions on what they think will make them the most money. Morality doesn't enter into it. Sega has always been the underdog and has used guerrilla marketing to distinguish itself from Nintendo and to compete with them. Remember these ads? Once you start playing Sonic the Hedgehog... No, of course not, because you're American. Here's a US ad that better illustrates my point. Danita Stokes, president of HAG. It's bad enough that Sega Genesis has the most 16-bit games, but this new Sonic the Hedgehog, oh, he really dusts my doilies. They say he's incredibly fast. Well, what's the hurry, mister? Hmm? And about his attitude. Smarty pants, 
Why can't it be more like that nice boy, Mario? Oh! Little brat! Now, get Sonic free when you buy a Sega Genesis system at its new price of $149.99. Sega has always deliberately cultivated a counterculture image, cool and edgy. That's their corporate identity, and working with fans and fan games, even posting memes poking fun at some of the less child-friendly fan artists, is all part of that. They've also made a ton of money out of Sonic Mania. They had their fans develop a game for them, and released it officially because they knew it would work for them financially. It was the highest scoring Sonic game for 15 years. It nearly doubled their packaged software sales, and led to a huge increase in sales and operating profit. Nintendo didn't do that, but they also kind of never needed to. Sonic games have been mm, hit and miss for the last couple of decades, certainly in terms of sales, but Mario has always sold incredibly well. Sonic Mania got 11th place on Nintendo of America's eShop Best Sellers list in 2017, with three Mario games above it. I know that's just Switch, but Sonic Mania came out in August 2017, Mario Odyssey in October 2017. Sega announced in April 2018 that Sonic Mania had sold a million copies. Mario Odyssey sold two million copies within its first three days. Sonic Mania was a big seller for Sega, but Nintendo and Mario are in a whole other league. Nintendo would rather develop their games in-house with the talent they have than work with fan creators, and that's worked for them so far. As a much bigger company than Sega, they think it's more in their interests to protect their IPs if they even suspect it might cause them trouble down the line, either by being even a little bit monetized, as was the case with Game Jolt, or by doing something they might prefer to do themselves at some point, or something they just think, for whatever reason, might bring Nintendo or Mario into disrepute. They don't need the goodwill of Mario superfans, they're creating a multimedia empire. Bear in mind, none of us really knows what's going on at Sega or Nintendo, so this is a lot of opinion, and feel free to address your theories in the comments. Essentially though, Nintendo is trying to be Disney, and Sega is just the scrappy little upstart disruptor it always was. In fact, maybe Nintendo is learning directly from just how litigious Disney is. The only reason copyright terms are as long as they are is because Disney wanted to keep the first Mickey Mouse cartoon, Steamboat Willie, from going into the public domain for as long as possible. The Sonny Bono Copyright Extension Act 1998 also known as the Mickey Mouse Protection Act, extended corporate authored copyright terms from 75 years to 95 years. So let's see, Steamboat Willie was published in 1928. So under the old rules, its copyright would have lasted until 2003. Uh, 20 years, 2023. Oh, I think we're gonna be watching a cartoon at the end of this video. The 1998 Act came into force five years before Steamboat Willie's copyright term was up, and I don't think that's a coincidence. Disney lobbied for copyright extension throughout the 90s, leading to these ridiculously long terms. The original point of copyright was to allow authors to profit from the exclusivity of their works for a good chunk of their lifetimes, and then they would go public domain. The first public copyright law was the Statute of Anne, passed in Great Britain in 1710. You know what the copyright term was for the Statue of Anne? You know? 14 years. 14. Okay, so not exactly. If the author lived long enough, they could extend the copyright term by another 14 years. And that wasn't exactly guaranteed, given the life expectancy at the time was 36 years. Still, that's a maximum of just 28 years before a work goes public domain. About 78% of the life expectancy at the time. Life expectancy, 80 years. You would have about 62 years. So where are we getting 95? Well, Disney. And the Stationers Company, who in 1731 first lobbied for extension of copyright terms just 21 years after the first copyright law had passed. My point is, twas ever thus. Corporations have consistently lobbied to keep copyright terms as long as possible, and politicians have consistently listened. For money. While we're talking about the UK, remember the Discworld of video games? They're these really fun, well-acted, well-written, point-and-click adventure games based on Terry Pratchett's Discworld novels. Terry Pratchett was a much-beloved writer of some of the greatest fantasy novels ever written before dying far too soon in 2015. If you haven't read any, start with Guard Guards or Mort. Now who's the booktuber? Comedy legend Eric Idle, probably best known for his portrayal of Brian Hope in the 1990 cinema classic Nuns on the Run, plays the main character Rincewind in the first two games. Oh! Well, this one's not a statue. 
I think this one used to be a frog out in the garden. Ah, well, he never should have asked to be turned into a handsome plinth. American viewers might know him as documentary maker Declan Desmond from four episodes of The Simpsons, or as a member of an obscure British sketch comedy group called Monty Python. He's that one. There'll be an arrow. Discworld was released in 1995 for MS-DOS, macOS and PlayStation, then in 1996 on Sega Saturn. Then nothing. No re-release. For a game so well received, what happened? Why is its most recent release on the Sega Saturn, and why no re-releases of Discworld 2 Missing Presumed or of Discworld Noir? Because of one man with a really ostentatious hat. After the collapse of British developer Perfect Entertainment, 50% of the rights of the Discworld games went to... The British Monarch. At time of editing, this is the British Monarch. And in British law, after a copyrighted work's original holder has been defunct for more than 10 years, 50% of the rights of that work go to the Crown and 50% to the original creator. Greg Barnett was the original writer and director for the first two games, so he and Charles III jointly own the copyright for the first two Discord games. It's up to them. They've probably never even met. If they did get together, they could agree to re-release Discworld on the Switch. Why couldn't Charles III simply give the rights back? He's got 287,000 acres of forest and agricultural land, almost all of Regent Street in London, 55% of the UK's foreshores, something like 20 massive castles and stately homes, and every swan. If anyone dies without a will or next of kin in Middle Ages Lancashire, he just gets the money and spends it on his massive houses, which he then rents out for private profit. He could easily give up the Discworld video games. Give us the Discworld video games, your majesty. You dick. Oh, I could have started a YouTube channel just to talk about everything that's wrong with the United Kingdom and why it would be better off being neither United nor a kingdom. But no. I just had to talk about SNES Doom. Abolish the monarchy because it's incredibly, incredibly unfair, expensive, corrupt, and silly. And copyright too, but to a lesser degree on all four counts. Uh, I think society, as we've made it for whatever weird reason, isn't really compatible with the immediate abolition of copyright. That's just my opinion. Maybe one day we could all create for the good of the collective and build freely on one another's works but I suspect that's a little way off. In the short term, though, you could definitely just reduce copyright terms so that Minerva... You just stay in there now. What? You're threatening me because it's wet food time. See what I have to put up with. You're just setting it in now for a good long stare. Don't you? It's a cat who needs feeding, isn't it? Claudia? In the short term, though, you could certainly reduce copyright terms to something more reasonable so that authors could profit from their works. But once that work's been around for a little while and becomes embedded in public culture, it becomes public domain as well. The Beatles, for example. Huge part of our culture. And I can't even sing you one of their songs right now, even though you already know all of the words. And silly, really. But fan games aren't out of order. Nintendo isn't out of order. The whole freaking system is out of order. You want the truth? You want the truth? You can handle the truth! Anyway, thanks for joining me on the Retro Sofa. Abolish the monarchy, vote pirate, subscribe to the channel, and then go enjoy some fan games. Sonic Retro's got loads. Also, to be fair, there are loads of like Mario fan games and ROM hacks out there as well that Nintendo's taken no action against. Nintendo has a reputation for sending loads of takedown requests, but they only really do it when they have a particular reason. And their reasons are their reasons. As the old saying goes, don't hate the player, hate the game. Anyway, uh, this was a long video and I'm tired, so I'm just going to kick back with some classic cartoons. Until next time.